I'm going to talk about uh, a big question, which is whether there's a link between autism and the human capacity for invention. And I hope to lay out the evidence for you to show you that there is such a link. But before I do that, um, when did invention begin? What's clear from the archaeological record is that our hominid ancestors could use simple stone tools. For example, Homo habilis and Homo erectus, who both lived about two million years ago, could use stone axes and hammers. And so could the Neanderthals, who lived as recently as 40,000 years ago. But despite small changes in the design of their tools, for millions of years, there was little evidence of what I call generative invention. So that's the, the ability to invent in multiple ways, not just as a one-off. And if we look at um, non-human species who are alive today, a lot of animals can use simple stone tools. For example, chimpanzees can use a rock as a hammer to crack a nut, and crows can drop a stone to raise the water level to be able to reach the bait. But both the behavior of other animals and of our hominid ancestors, I argue, can be parsimoniously explained as the result of associative learning. That's the ability to form an association between two items, A and B. But they nevertheless, uh, other animals and our ancestors showed little signs of generative invention. But then, 70 to 100,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens was on the scene, the rate of invention suddenly took off um, and it's been unstoppable ever since. Uh, suddenly we see the capacity for generative invention. So not just inventing once, but generating non-stop. So I argue that a cognitive revolution had occurred in the human brain. So what was this cognitive revolution? Well, there were two new circuits in the human brain. And the first of these I call the systemizing mechanism. So this allowed humans to look for special patterns in the world, uh, patterns that I call if and then patterns. And these are the basis of any system that if I take something and I do something to it, then I get an outcome if and then. So the systemizing mechanism allowed us to analyze the world to find such patterns and then to confirm that they hold true. And the way we do this is we repeat our observations over and over again until we've confirmed them. But then we can experiment with the patterns. We can play with them. We can experiment with the if or with the and. And once we find a new pattern, that is an, an invention. And you can see here um, the picture of George Boole, the 19th century logician, who first talked about the if and then logic in the structure of human thought. So we can infer the existence of the systemizing mechanism in the modern human brain, because 75,000 years ago, we see the first jewelry. And imagine the thought of the ancestor who made it, that if I make a hole in each shell and thread a string through each hole, then the shell will form a necklace. So it's if and then. And 71,000 years ago, we see the first bow and arrow. Again, the same if and then algorithm. If I attach an arrow to a stretchy fiber and release the tension in the fiber, then the arrow will fly. And 40,000 years ago, we see the earliest musical instrument that's ever been found, a flute made of a hollow bone. So again, imagine the thought of the ancestor who made it, that if I blow down the hollow bone and cover one hole, then I make a specific sound. But if I blow down the hollow bone and cover two holes, then I make a different sound. So our ancestor had invented a complex tool, a musical instrument, and a system of sounds that we call music. 
And 40,000 years ago, we see cave paintings. 25,000 years ago, we see sculptures. And by 12,000 years ago, we see the invention of agriculture. Again, the if and then algorithm. If I take a tomato seed and plant it in moist soil, then I get a tomato plant. And we just have to think about how the invention of agriculture transformed our diet, transformed our health and our lifestyles. And we're still inventing unstoppably today. A recent example, which has, has been talked about earlier, the invention of the vaccine. If I take the genes for COVID spike protein and I put them into a harmless virus, then I have a vaccine against COVID. But let's go back to the first jewelry 75,000 years ago, because the systemizing mechanism explains how we were able to make the jewelry, but a different mechanism, the empathy circuit, explains why we made it. We wear jewelry because we can imagine what someone else might think or might feel when they're looking at us. They might think we are beautiful or of high status, or we might make the jewelry as a gift because we can imagine someone else might feel happy. So the evolution of empathy, a different circuit, enabled a whole raft of complex social interactions, including deception and referential communication. But let's go back to our big question. Is there a link between autism and invention? Well, anecdotally, many um, inventors show high levels of autistic traits. So this is the young Thomas Edison, who famously invented the first electric light bulb, but he invented nonstop. And as a teenager, he was obsessed with Morse code, a system of patterns. And he even named his children Dot and Dash. And his wife moved a mattress into his workshop so that he could carry on inventing and experimenting all day and all night. And anecdotally, many autistic people have a talent in pattern recognition and in systemizing. So this is Max Park, who is autistic. And despite his social difficulties, he's the world champion in the Rubik's Cube, a system of visual patterns. But anecdotes are not evidence. So we've done some research. We looked at 600,000 people in the general population and we measured their autistic traits using a questionnaire called the AQ or the Autism Spectrum Quotient. And we found that those people who worked in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, on average had more autistic traits than those who did not work in STEM. So this shows a clear link between aptitude in understanding systems and higher levels of autistic traits. And those 600,000 people also took two other questionnaires, the empathy quotient, the EQ, and the systemizing quotient, the SQ. Um, and what we found was that you can divide the whole population into five brain types based on whether an individual leans more towards empathy or more towards systemizing. So those who lean more towards empathy, we call type E, and those who lean more towards systemizing, we call type S. Um, and of course, there are those who um, are an extreme. They systemize nonstop and they see patterns everywhere. We call them extreme type S but they struggle to understand people's thoughts and feelings. What we found, you can see the data on the right, was that more women, shown in yellow, are type E, more men, shown in green, are type S, and then the majority of autistic people, we had 36,000 of them take part, shown in red and purple, are type S or extreme type S. So again, more evidence for a link between autism and hyper-systemizing. 
But is the link between autism and pattern seeking genetic? We had the opportunity to work with the personal genomics company 23andMe, and we found that the genetic variants associated with high systemizing overlap with the genetic variants associated with autism. So some of the genes that cause autism also cause talent in pattern recognition. So this leads to a prediction that autism might be more common in places like Silicon Valley. We went to the Dutch city of Eindhoven, where one third of the jobs are in IT, and which is home to the Institute of Technology, much like MIT, and where the Philips factory has been there for over 100 years. What we found was that autism rates were twice as high in Eindhoven compared to two other Dutch cities, Utrecht and, ha and Haarlem, matched for demographics. So this again fits with the idea of a genetic link between autism in the child and a talent in pattern seeking among the parents. So we've got evidence that the genes for autism have driven human invention. But how are we as a society treating autistic people? The majority of autistic people are unemployed and they have high levels of poor mental health, likely the result of lack of support and being excluded from the worlds of education and work. We owe autistic people a huge debt of gratitude for the role that their genes have played in human progress. And we have a moral responsibility to ensure that no group of individuals are deprived of their human rights to education, employment, and participation in society. So I think it's time for a change. We can learn from the Israeli army that has a special unit who only recruit autistic adults because of their aptitude to look at thousands of aerial photographs like this one, to look for unexpected patterns that might be a sign of terrorist activity. So they are making sure that autistic people are included and are playing their part in society. It's time to embrace the concept of neurodiversity, the idea that brains come in many varieties and none is better or worse than another. They're just different. Thank you.